Hey everybody, this is going to be an update video regarding the game Enlisted, which is a World War II free-to-play first-person shooter that I covered on the channel a couple of weeks ago as I'm making this video. So if you're tuning into this update but you haven't seen the original video, go ahead and pause this video, go watch the original. I know it's a long video, just bear with me on that. Because that being the main video that I've done on Enlisted for the channel, I have to break down the gameplay mechanics, game modes, all that sort of thing. So I break all that down, I break down the entire game's economy, its research grind, all of it. So if you haven't seen that before watching this update, go ahead and pause this video and go watch the original. Make sure you understand exactly where I'm coming from on that, and then you can come back to this video, because this update video is really about addressing a few arguments that kept coming up in the comments, as well as the big update they just pushed that overhauled the game's economy somewhat. So there's going to be a link to the original video in the video description box, as well as the card things that come up on the screen, so you can quickly and easily go and watch that first, then come back here. For those of you who have already seen the original Enlisted video, let's just go ahead and address some of the things people brought up in the comments, as well as this new economy update. And we'll start with some things that were pointed out to me that I either missed or that I misinterpreted because the game did a really poor job of explaining them. First, you can in fact move the AT cannons that you can build as the engineer. You have to switch to the second crew position to be able to move them. However, this is only for the emplaced AT cannons, not the anti-air guns. And more importantly, they're so slow to move that, frankly, there's absolutely no point in doing so. It would be quicker to actually just deconstruct the cannon where it currently is and then go somewhere else and rebuild it there. As for why I didn't know this, it's because the game does an extremely poor job of telling you about it. In fact, it doesn't tell you about it. The only way you would know that is if somebody else who had been playing the game longer than you told you about it, or if you somehow notice the tiny text that tells you that the gun crew is actually two people and it's not just the gunner that you're currently playing, and decide to switch crew members just to see what the other crew crew member could do. Now, on the one hand, this would speak to poor tutorialization, but it actually goes back to the unlock system and the leveling system that I criticized in the original video, because you don't get to build AT cannons or even AA guns right from the get-go as an engineer. You have to level your squad up first to unlock those abilities. So if you go into the engineer tutorial, it will tell you how to build the things that the engineer class starts with the ability to produce. So that would be the sandbags, tank traps, barbed wire, uh, ammo boxes, and rally points. But it will not tell you how to build AA guns or AT guns because you don't have those unlocked yet. And that is, once again, locking basic important gameplay features behind a grind wall and under no circumstances should any game whether it's free to play or not ever do this you are creating a situation where new players are outright penalized simply for not having played the game longer as a reminder the only three squads you get when you start enlisted as any faction are a basic infantry squad, which is all just riflemen using bolt-action rifles, a recon squad, where you get a single sniper by default, and then two riflemen with them, and a land vehicle squad that starts out the game equipped with either a light tank, depending on which faction they're in, or, in the case of the US, an armored car with a couple of machine guns mounted on it, which, of course, brings up the whole faction imbalancing thing again, but anyway, point is that you get those three squads by default, and the only thing you can do with infantry squads and recon squads until you have unlocked different soldier types is shoot at other infantry, although if one of the squad members is equipped with a TNT pack, they can throw that at an enemy vehicle and disable it, if of course they're able to get close enough to the vehicle to do so, and the vehicle doesn't move out of the radius of the explosion, which is incredibly easy for them to do. And more importantly, you cannot equip the various squad members with TNT packs beyond the ones that you start with until you have completed enough Tier 1 research to unlock all of the Tier 1 completion rewards. Because that's when you're able to purchase more TNT packs for your squads, 
And that requires you to grind quite a lot in order to unlock basic gameplay features. Again, we keep coming back to this point because apparently the enlisted community does not seem to understand. So let me try to break this down into terms that you might understand. This is basically like if somebody told you to assemble a piece of furniture and provided you with a single hammer and a single flathead screwdriver, then told you that everything else you need is included in the package that the furniture comes in, and then when you open the package and go to assemble the furniture, you find out you actually also need an Allen wrench to assemble it, and the Allen wrench is not included. So you go to the person who sold you the furniture and say, hey, Hey, where's the Allen wrench in this thing? It needs an Allen wrench, and they say, Oh, right, the Allen wrench. Yeah, you're not allowed to have that until you've spent at least five or six hours trying to assemble the furniture. Oh, and you uh, also didn't notice this yet because you haven't gotten to that point in the instructions, but you're also going to need a Phillips head screwdriver, and you're not allowed to have that until about 10 hours in. Then, instead of rightly saying this is utterly ridiculous, you try to muddle your way through building the furniture, they do eventually give you the Allen wrench, and you keep muddling your way through, they do eventually give you a Phillips head screwdriver, and then you find out that what was included in the package were actually Phillips head bolts, not Phillips head screws, so you go back to the person who gave you the furniture and say, hey, these are Phillips head bolts, they're not screws, I can't use these to put this furniture together, and they go, oh, right! At your current level of Phillips head screwdriver, you're only allowed to use Phillips head bolts. You're gonna need to gain some experience points and level up your Phillips head screwdriver in order to be able to use Phillips head screws. Obviously this analogy is getting utterly ridiculous, but I hope I got the point across here. Important gameplay mechanics that are ultimately vital to your team's success are locked behind a grind wall. You can make all the arguments you want for being able to make squads more versatile by equipping them with different soldier types than the main soldier type that squad has. So for example, equipping a rifleman squad with machine gunners, snipers, uh, anti-tank gunners, or engineers, or whatever, making them a more versatile squad in the process. That's still a bit annoying, but at least you're just making the squad more versatile and not compromising its ability to perform its primary role. Meanwhile, if your team doesn't have access to a vehicle with a cannon capable of penetrating the enemy vehicle's armor, then building an AT cannon is going to be a very important thing. And more importantly, there are only two defenses against enemy aircraft. Those are your own team's aircraft and the AA guns. Again, as I mentioned in the original video, you can try shooting at enemy aircraft with your small arms, but you're not going to hit them. And as it turns out, the situation is actually worse when it comes to anti-air vehicles than I thought it was in the original video. Because I was looking through the tech trees and I didn't see any anti-air vehicles at all, and the community pointed out to me that the US and Japanese forces basically start with an AA vehicle unlocked. They're never actually used as AA vehicles by any players in the game, but they're technically considered AA vehicles. But if you're playing as the Germans or the Soviets, the only way you can get an anti-air vehicle is if you play specific events. The German Flockpanzer and the USSR's Gaz-M are locked behind event grinds. So if you just didn't happen to play at the time those events were available, then too bad. You don't get anti-air vehicles as those two factions. You see, I knew about the event they had for paratroopers. I didn't know they had events for anti-air vehicles. That just makes the whole exploitation of FOMO, fear of missing out, even worse. Hell, given how they've handled paratroopers, where if you didn't complete that one event that would unlock paratroopers, then you have to buy them as a premium squad. I'm actually legitimately surprised that the USSR and Axis don't have to buy premium squads if they want to have anti-air vehicles. And speaking of the premium squads, I have been made aware that some of those premium squads are much more dangerously close to being pay-to-win than others. 
I have already talked about the premium paratroopers for the U.S. having 100 round drum magazines on their Thompsons, thus having the best submachine guns in the game, but those aren't even the only instances of premium squads having similar guns to what the free-to-play players get, only with considerably higher magazine capacity. There's also a light machine gun squad, for example, that has 75 round drum magazines for their machine guns, whereas the standard versions get a 25 round magazine. But it gets even more ridiculous. There is a Japanese squad that gets fully automatic rifles that have shields mounted on them, so that when enemies are shooting at them, the bullets will actually hit the shields instead of the soldiers and do absolutely no damage to the soldiers themselves. Now sure, after a couple of hits, the shield will fall off of the rifle and that soldier will be able to take damage after that, but if you're a free-to-play player, you don't get access to those shields, so you're just at a disadvantage compared to the people who shelled out some extra cash for them. It may not be enough to kick the game fully into pay-to-win territory, but it does edge dangerously close to that, and it's abundantly clear that Dark Flow have absolutely no qualms with giving paid players straight-up advantages over free-to-play players. And frankly, it's only a matter of time until they implement some sort of premium squad that completely crosses the line. Now that covers everything I wanted to talk about for premium squads. I already definitely railed on that enough in the original video. But I do want to further address the game's balancing. Now, I mentioned in the original video that the way the matchmaking in this game works is that BR1 and BR2 are supposed to be matched together, and BR4 and BR5 are supposed to be matched together, and BR3 is split between them based on just whoever is available to play at any given time. This means that BR1 and 2 will get up-tiered with BR3, and BR3 will get up-tiered with BR4 and 5. Now, as I mentioned in the original video, this means that if you're a BR3 player who gets up-tiered into BR4 and 5, then it tends to be downright miserable because you're at a significant disadvantage compared to the BR4 and 5 players, whereas if you're a BR3 player and you get down-tiered into BR1 and 2, you're at an advantage compared to the BR1 and 2 players. It's not as dramatic of a difference as it is with BR4 and 5 players, but it is noticeable. And yet, despite me having plenty of video clips showing exactly that phenomenon happening, there were a couple of comments that I received on that video that didn't seem to think up-tiering is a thing that happens. So if you're somehow confused about that, let me restate this, because this is how the matchmaking system currently works. If you are BR1 or BR2, you are supposed to be matched with BR1 and BR2 players. If you're BR4 or BR5, you're supposed to be matched with BR4 and 5 players. BR3 players get sorted into either BR1 and 2 matches or BR4 and 5 matches, depending on what is available. If they happen to be jumping into the matchmaking at a time when only a BR1 and 2 match is going to be available, they're going to get sorted into that match, and they're going to be at an advantage compared to the BR1 and 2 players. If, however, the matches that are available are BR4 and 5 matches, they'll get sorted into those and be at a disadvantage compared to the BR4 and 5 players. And again, if you are playing BR3 and you get down-tiered, it's not really a problem for you. In fact, you're at an advantage. If you get up-tiered, however, then it becomes downright miserable because you're at a distinct disadvantage. Now, the difference isn't quite as stark between BRs 1, 2, and 3 as it is with BRs 3, 4, and 5. So, BR1 and 2 can hold their own against BR3 as long as they have sufficiently unlocked things that will allow their team to succeed. If, however, you are just fresh on the particular faction you're playing and haven't unlocked anything, getting up-tiered is very irritating. And if you, for whatever reason, still don't think this is a thing that happens, let's conduct a bit of an experiment. So I'm doing this as a live commentary because I know that if I don't do this as a live commentary, the enlisted fans will inevitably say I'm manipulating footage or some other nonsense like that. But one of the criticisms that came up of my assessment of enlisted in the original video 
is that they fix the matchmaking so that you don't get up tiered as a BR1 anymore. So that uh, you're only in BR1 and 2. So, the thing about that is that immediately after the economy update came out, I went back into this game and started messing around with it to test out the overhauled economy. And in almost every single match I was playing, I was being up-tiered. Now, as the, the Axis, which I have actual stuff unlocked here, as you can see, I have AT gunners, I have engineers, and uh, medics. I can actually still do stuff with the Axis team because I have basic gameplay features unlocked, unlike with the USSR, the US, or Japan. I do have medics unlocked for Japan and the USSR because of um, some experience point bonuses that I had from daily login bonuses and such. But anyway, I still can't really do anything else with these uh, factions. So, for example, the engineer squad for the USSR is locked behind the Mosin 1938 carbine, which, as you can see, I currently have set to research. With the Japanese, it is locked behind the Type 1 rifle. So uh, I would have to grind that one out to unlock them for that. Um, with the USSA, it's the Enfield, and i am currently got that researching as well. So we're just going to run an experiment here. I'm just going to jump into the matches, and we're going to see how long it takes before I can tell we've been up-tiered. Because people keep telling me, oh no, getting up tier doesn't happen as a BR1. Well, every single faction I have here is BR1. Let's see how long it takes me to get up tiered. I even have join any army enabled. We're going to jump right in. We're going to see how long it takes. Alright, Fortress West. This is going to be Axis versus US. So which team am I on? I'm on US. Okay, cool. So I can basically do nothing useful with this team because... Well, the only thing I've really got is this uh, MGMC, which, by the way, is apparently an AA vehicle, even though nobody actually uses it as one. Something else I'm addressing in the uh, overarching commentary update thing that I'm putting together for this. But we're just going to uh, jump in here, and we're going to see how long it takes for me to notice I've been up-tiered. If I've even been up-tiered at all. I might not have been up-tiered in this particular match. We'll see. But this is the very first match of the day, by the way. I have not played any enlisted today prior to this. So we're just going to charge in. Because there's nothing else I can do with this squad. I mean, I just I can shoot at enemy players and chuck some grenades at things. That's all I got. Oh look, he's got an MP40. That's a that is a tier 3 weapon. We've been up tiered. How long was that? Like a minute at most before we notice we're up tiered. So there you have it. If for whatever reason someone tells you that you don't get up tiered in this game, you definitely do. There was the video proof. Now something else I want to go over is that the community also kept telling me that you have much more control over your squad than I previously said you did, which amounted to being able to tell your squad to hold a position. Obviously, you can still do that. The thing is that you only have a single squad command button. That tells the squad to do a context-sensitive thing, However, it's not clear that it's going to be context sensitive, because at nearly all times, it's just a hold position option. If you aim at a vehicle, the context sensitive action will change to attack this vehicle. However, in the experimentation I did trying to get my squads to attack enemy vehicles, I found that the only way they would actually do this is by running up to it and throwing TNT packs at it. Even if they were an AT squad and were equipped with anti-tank weapons. And that's if they even decided to do anything at all. A lot of times I would order them to attack vehicles and they would do absolutely nothing. 
So there seems to be a very limited range on them actually being able to do this. Now, I was able to reliably get the squad to build things when I was playing an engineer squad. However, I always had to place down the blueprint for whatever it was I was building first. So it was more like the squad was actually just helping me build the thing that I was trying to build, rather than actually having a build order option. You can technically place down the blueprint and then tell your squad to build the thing, and they will build it. However, you have to start the construction yourself, and if you're going to do that, you might as well finish it yourself. Because if you order your squad to do it, then a single member of the squad, regardless of how many engineers you have in it, will start building it without any assistance, and you can always build things more quickly if you have at least two engineers working on it. Now, as for the claim I kept getting that squad members will definitely use their equipment and grenades, no, they don't. I've ordered them to attack enemies, I've ordered them to hold positions, it did not matter, they would not throw grenades at anything. And the only equipment they would use is the hammer, if they're an engineer, and that was only to help you build things or to build things that you ordered them to build, or the first aid kit if they happen to take damage but don't go down immediately. And it did not matter what mode I had set the squad to. You can either set them to be aggressive or passive, but they're in aggressive by default, and that means that they will actually try to attack enemies that go within their sight radius, the thing is that they're still enlisted AI, so they're still dumber than a sack of bricks, and still basically useless. So I have absolutely no idea what the hell was going on with those enlisted fans who kept telling me that the squad command is actually really solid, because it's not. It is absolutely terrible, to the point where even the extremely simplistic squad controls of stuff like Ghost Recon Wildlands and Ghost Recon Breakpoint are vastly superior, because at the very least, your squad stays out of your way. They don't constantly get in the way when you're trying to shoot at things. They don't just blunder out into the open or even outright jump in and out of cover to let themselves get shot to pieces. They stay in stealth. They stay out of your way. When you order them to attack things, they will attack things. When you are getting into combat, they'll actually hit what they're aiming at reliably. And if you get down, they will try to get you back up, unlike, say, the medic squads in Enlisted, where even though they have the ability to heal teammates, they will not do it even if members of their own squad get injured or downed. The simple fact of the matter is that Enlisted Squad AI and Squad Command System are so incredibly basic and awful that it becomes completely unreliable. You end up having to do everything yourself anyway, so why is the squad system even in the game at all? Frankly, the game would actually be better without the squad system. The only thing the squads actually end up doing are serving as quick respawn units to where whenever you happen to go down, you can just switch over to a different squad member and continue instead of having to go back into the respawn queue. And probably much more importantly, they help to pad players' KD ratios. The phrase, shooting fish in a barrel, comes to mind. It's not challenging, it's not fun, it's just boring. And since Darkflow and Gaijin, despite constantly saying that they're working on it, haven't been able to significantly improve the AI and squad commands in the several years that this game has been available, despite constant complaints from the player base, tells me that it's never actually going to improve. Because if it's been this long and squads are such a core element of this game, then either there is some sort of engine limitation that is actively preventing them from improving it, or they just don't actually care even though they say they're working on it all the time. And while the extremely cynical part of me wants to think it's the latter, I'm pretty sure it's actually the former. It's probably some sort of engine limitation that they can't work around, so they just keep saying they're working on it, because that's more non-committal and gives the impression they're actually doing something when they can't. And while I'm nearly 100% certain that it's never actually going to get better, if by some insane miracle it actually does improve, then I will update this video somehow, whether it be something in the video description or in a pinned comment or something like that. 
Now then, there is also the elephant in the room with this particular update video, which is the overhaul that Dark Flow and Gaijin did for the grind, both in terms of research and in terms of silver. And they address this in the following ways. First, they dramatically reduce the number of research points required to complete research projects pretty much across the board. In some cases, it's closer to cutting them in half. In some cases, it's more like a fourth. It just depends on the individual research. But it is definitely a significant reduction in the number of research points required in order to complete a research project. It still takes a long time, however, because the amount of research points you earn are dependent on a variety of factors. The first is whether or not you happen to have any boosters active. You get some of those as daily login bonuses. Sometimes you have to complete challenges to unlock them. But these boosters can outright double the amount of experience points and research points you earn in any given match. But they're usually only active for only one match before they expire. Or they're only active for a limited amount of time. You actually have timers on them so that if you don't complete the matches in the time frame allotted, the booster just goes away. It's definitely an odd way of handling boosters. The way that would make sense to handle it is that you have the booster active for, say, a certain number of battles, and it doesn't matter when you go into those battles, you just complete them, and any booster you get after that would either go into an inventory that you could activate later, or if they don't want to do that, if they don't want to have people just hoarding boosters and then using them to make the grind not miserable, then I suppose what would make sense is for them to have the boosters replace whatever booster is currently active. Putting an arbitrary timer on it just is unnecessary. Anyway, if you have a booster active, then that will significantly increase the amount of experience points and research points you get. If you win the match, you also get a significant boost to the amount of experience points and research points you get. And they also implemented a bonus for the join any team option, basically so you can fill in any match that's currently available regardless of whether it's the faction you're trying to progress or not. And that will earn you extra experience and silver and thus, of course, RP as well, compared to if you didn't select that option and just went in with whatever your chosen faction was. Now, the number of experience points I referenced in the original video is roughly two to 4,000 experience points, and thus roughly two to 4,000 research points per match. And some enlisted fans took umbrage with that. And a lot of their complaints are that my estimates for the amount of experience you earn per match seem really low. They're taking into account all of these extra bonuses. I was talking baseline, without any boosters, without any bonuses, just the amount of experience points and research points you earn from completing a match, whether you win or lose, doesn't matter, the average is going to be around two to 4,000 per match. If you play better, you will earn more experience, you will earn more RP. If you play worse, you will earn less. If you have boosters active and you're using the join any team option and you win a match, you might be able to get it up to six to 10,000 experience and or RP per match. However, you have to remember that matches can go on for a very long time. Most matches are going to be around 20 to 30 minutes long. Sometimes they're longer than that, sometimes they're shorter than that, but generally they're going to be around 20 to 30 minutes long. This means that very early on in your progression, if you have these boosters active, if you're using join any team, and if you play really well, and you of course win the match, you're probably going to unlock the earliest things in the progression with very low RP fairly quickly. Especially in the case of the stuff that only costs 5,000 RP to begin with. In a lot of cases, you can just knock that out with a single match. However, the costs start getting considerably higher almost immediately. It starts taking 20 plus thousand, 30 plus thousand per unlock, and that's going to take you several matches. Meaning that unlocking, say, a single weapon might take you about two or three hours to unlock in the early game. 
the later you get into the progression, the higher the costs get, the longer it takes to unlock things. And all of this grind is cumulative, because you need to unlock things earlier in the progression in order to unlock things later in the progression. This is another thing I talked about in my original video, where you have to grind your way through a bunch of stuff you don't want, a lot of which is basically just slight variations of the same handful of things over and over again, in order to get to the stuff you actually want to use. And if for whatever reason you are still confused by that point, let me walk you through it. All right, switching over to live commentary for a second so I can more easily show you exactly what I mean on how grindy this game gets. So one of the things that I did bring up in the previous video but that seemed to be misunderstood is that if you want to get to the good stuff in this game, you have to grind through a bunch of stuff you don't want. So, just to quickly give you a, an example here. So, if I go into the, the USA's research tree, which is it's technically USA and Britain, but whatever. So, here's what you start with. You start with the 1903 Springfield and the 1903A1 USMC, as well as this uh, 1903A1. You have to unlock the M50 Rising. You have to unlock all this stuff here. I have not put really any time into the, the USA at all right now. Uh, I've put enough to put in 6,816 research points into the P14, which is what you need to get to the, uh, the engineer squad. Anyway, let's say I want to unlock the M1 Garand. The M1 Garand is awesome. The M1 Garand is one of those iconic World War II weapons. So if I want to get to that, that is all the way at the beginning of Tier 4. So in order to unlock that, I first need to research the Enfield P14. And then the 1917 Enfield, which is a very slightly different version of the Pattern 14. The difference is this is in 303 British, and this is in 30-06. That's it. That's the difference. Well, this, this one gets a single extra round, but functionally, they're pretty much the same. Then after that, I have to get the Ross Mark III, which is another 303 British rifle. Then I can get the M1 carbine, which is at least a semi-automatic carbine, even though it's in 30 carbine. Then after that, I have to get the British SMLE Mark III, and then the Lee Enfield Number 4 Mark I, which is a slightly different SMLE. You seeing the problem here? And then after I've gotten the, the number four Mark I, I can finally research the M1 Garand. This is what I'm talking about. You have to grind through a bunch of stuff you don't want in order to get th to anything that you might actually be interested in. So for this, you have to complete the research for tier... Th so here here's how this works. So, you see this progress bar up here where I have 4 out of 9 research for Tier 1. Once I've researched 9 total things in Tier 1, then I unlock Tier 2. So, even if I research this, the, the Pattern 14, I can't even research the, the 1917 infield until I have completed this level of research from any of this other stuff that I'm not interested in. So... It could be, of course, I mean, obviously I would want to get that, and I would want to get that, and I would want to get that, and I would want to get that. So that brings me up to 8 out of 9. Okay, that's fine. But then what do I pick? Well, do I, I want to get a Sten or an M3? Well, I guess I'll probably want to research along this line to eventually unlock the, the Thompson submachine guns. So I, I'd probably go into the Sten Mark II, because I can't research the the grease gun until I can get the Sten Mark II, and then I get a slight variation of the M3 grease gun. And we have a shotgun, then we have the Owen, which uh, that's an Australian submachine gun. Then we get a semi-automatic shotgun, which is kind of neat, I guess. And then we get the, the Lanchester SMG, which is more or less like a German MP28, but British. And then finally you get into the M1 Thompsons. Although, I find it interesting that the M1A1 is unlocked before the normal M1. That makes no sense at all. But whatever. 
the way they've set this up requires you to grind through a bunch of stuff you don't want in order to get to the stuff you do want. So even if I complete the, the research that I'm actually kind of interested in here, so unlocking the AT squad, unlocking the medic squad, unlocking the engineer squad, and unlocking the um, aircraft. So I would still need to pick something else to research. So let's just say in order to make things quicker and easier, I select the M2. Okay, fine. That, that doesn't take much to unlock. Now I've unlocked Tier 2. Now I can start researching these things. However... I can't research things unless I've completed the previous research. So unlocking Tier 2 would allow me to research the Vickers Berthier, but unless I had already gotten the Pattern 14 or the M3 Grease Gun or the M5A1 or the F2A3 Buffalo, I would not be able to research those things. And same with this 2-inch mortar. I wouldn't be able to research the M1 Bazooka. You have to complete the previous research to get to the stuff you want to use. So, again, I hope you really like bolt-action rifles, because you're going to be stuck with them for a very long time. So now that you see what's going on with the research grind, what about the actual equipment grind? I mentioned in the original video that the silver grind, the in-game currency grind, is absolutely miserable, and it was at that time, because the prices for various items were high enough to where the amount of silver you were earning per match just was nowhere near sufficient to fully equip and upgrade your squads. Now they have lowered the silver costs of things across the board, whether it's the various weapons or the tools that you have access to or whatever, they have definitely lowered the costs and it is all considerably more reasonable than it used to be because the amount of silver you earn per match is still quite low. This is another thing that people kept bringing up in the original video as if I wasn't aware of this and as if I somehow didn't mention it, but I certainly was aware and certainly did mention that the amount of silver you earn depends on your in-match performance. The better you perform, the more silver you earn. It's the same as with the general experience for squads as well as with the research points you earn. However, while in experience and research points you will earn a few thousand per match, in the realm of silver you're looking at about a thousand per match if you're playing really well and you get the win bonus. Otherwise you're looking at about half of that, so somewhere in the realm of 500 to 600 silver per match. Again, before the enlisted fans start shrieking about how they earn so much more silver than that, that's without any bonuses applied, whether it's boosters, win bonuses, premium bonuses, join any game bonuses, whatever. That is just purely you're playing the game normally. Now, with the previous pricing that they had for all the various items, that was just far too little for what you were actually able to get. Now that they've lowered the costs across the board, it's a lot more reasonable. However, you're still going to have to complete a silver grind in order to be able to fully equip and upgrade your squads. Because even though they did dramatically lower the costs of the items themselves, you're still gonna have to spend a few thousand silver to properly upgrade and equip your squads. So it's definitely still an annoying, tedious slog, but it's less of an annoying, tedious slog than it used to be. It's not really saying all that much, but it's something at least. And while I'm on the subject of the silver grind and unlocking stuff, I wanted to go ahead and reiterate something that I said in the original video, and which I also expanded upon in the original video, which is that whenever you complete research in this game, you then have to buy the ability to buy whatever it is that you just finished researching. There were quite a few comments in the original video that kept saying that I was wrong on that, that you don't buy the ability to buy things, you just buy the things. This is not true. And a lot of these people who were complaining about this did not notice that I had corrected myself in text. Because I did make a mistake in the audio commentary, but corrected myself with text that came up on the screen as I was speaking. 
And that mistake was about the number of items you would need to purchase in order to fully equip a squad. I said that in order to have a fully equipped squad with M1 Garens, you would purchase the ability to purchase the item that you wanted to equip your squad with, and then you would have to purchase nine of that item in order to fully equip your squad. This was a mistake because when you purchase the ability to purchase the item, it also comes with a copy of that item. So in the case of, say, the M1 Garand, you would purchase the ability to purchase the M1 Garand, and it would give you an M1 Garand, in addition to the ability to purchase more M1 Garands. So instead of having to buy nine M1 Garands to fully equip your squad, you would have to buy eight additional M1 Garands. So you're still technically buying nine of them, but you're buying the first one as part of the unlock process. It's still a really dumb and somewhat confusing way of handling the unlock system and the equipment purchasing system, and that was really the main point there, is just how convoluted and dumb this system was. However, because I happen to be criticizing the game that they seem to absolutely love, enlisted fans decided to latch onto that one particular thing and start acting like I don't know what I'm talking about, even though I outright corrected myself in the video itself. So you know what? Just to prevent people from trying to latch on to this again and act like I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm just going to show you how it works. Alright, folks. So I just completed some research here. This is back to live commentary, as you can tell. So, we've got research completed M2A4. I am actually not going to click on purchase just yet because I want to click back and show you exactly how this works. So, let's say I want to equip the M2 to my tank squad instead of the MGMC. So, the M2 is right here. I select it. I can't purchase it. I can't equip it. It says available in research. I go to research. I click on it. It says purchase. Research not purchased yet. Purchase. Received item. Go to squad. See, now I can equip it. So, the thing is that this is a vehicle, so you're not necessarily going to get the, the same effect that you would if it were, say, the M50 Rising or this uh, Enfield P14 here. So, let's, uh, let's see here. Let's go ahead and uh, start this research. I'm going to go ahead and complete it. Now I want to show you how this works. So this is how the, the M50 Rising is now available, except it's not. So if I go into weaponry, M50 Rising, research needed. I select it. Purchase. To purchase, you need research M50 Rising. Go hit researches. So, see, you do, in fact, have to purchase the ability to purchase the item in question. The thing is that when you purchase it, in this particular case, it gives you a squad. If it were just the weapon by itself, then I would have only received a single example of the M50 Rising, and then I would have to purchase additional ones. I said as much in the original video in the text that came up. So, I'm going to go ahead and throw this back in. Actually, no, I, you know what? We might as well go ahead and finish this research here. The only reason I have so much uh, RP from the last mission there is because I had a 100% experience booster from a daily login reward. In fact, you can see it right there. So there's only one more battle left on that. And still, most of what you get, as far as silver is concerned, is from achievements and battle pass stuff and such like that. That said, we now have the M50 Rising on him, but on him and him, they both have 1903 Springfield. So if I want to equip the squad, then I need to go and purchase two additional M50 Risings. Like so. And then, of course, if I wanted to upgrade them, I have to go through the uh, the grind here. And I have to specifically put squad upgrade points into this. 
So that is how the unlock system works. It is dumb. It is ridiculous. I'm going to go ahead and uh, just throw all that research into the AT rifle there so I can get AT squads. But anyway, that's how it works. Again, I said as much in the original video, but people kept acting like I didn't know what I was talking about because I accidentally said in the audio commentary, even though I corrected this in text that came up on the screen, that you would need to buy... So let's say if you unlock the M50 Rising and you wanted to equip a, a full squad with it, you would have to buy... Let's say you get a, a squad of three. So you would have to buy three. I said that you would have to buy three, and then I corrected in the text that came up on the screen that you would actually need to buy the ability to buy M50 Risings because that comes with one, and then you would need to buy two additional ones on top of that. Now, it's the same price to purchase one as it is to purchase the ability to unlock it, which makes sense. But it's still a dumb system. It should just be that when you finish the research, it just becomes available for purchase. That's It's that simple. It, that's how it should be. Anyway, there you go, folks. Back to the rest of the video. So yeah, for those of you who were complaining that I apparently didn't know what I was talking about and was spreading misinformation because I was saying you have to buy the ability to buy things, you've now seen the actual video proof that you do, in fact, have to buy the ability to buy things. Again, I did make a mistake in the original video about the number of items you would have to purchase to fully equip a squad if you had just unlocked the research. But I had corrected myself in the text that popped up on the screen, which if you care to check was at 30 minutes and 56 seconds. Although even though I have done a live commentary clip here showing you exactly how it works in pretty exhaustive detail, I wouldn't be surprised if there are comments on this video complaining about how, oh, no you don't have to buy the ability to buy things, even though you clearly do. Presumably this time because I didn't record it in Russian, or I don't know, honestly. Enlisted fans confuse me with their bizarre love of this game and their bizarre attempts to defend its bullshit. I mean, hell, a lot of the comments I got on the original video were basically just like, Oh, you think it's bad now? It used to be way worse. As if that somehow absolves the game of the sins it's still committing. And what really gets me is that there is a decent chunk of the population that seems to think because the game is technically free to play, that magically absolves it of all the issues it has as well. As if free to play games and pay to play games are somehow completely incomparable. You cannot compare one to the other and actually have it make sense. That's not remotely how this works. And the especially funny part about this whole thing is that when Enlisted launched on Steam, it launched on Steam as a pay-to-play game. You couldn't just download the game and start playing it. You had to buy a sort of starter pack in order to be able to play the game on Steam. Thus, it was a buy-to-play game. And that went over so poorly that they had to pull the game from Steam entirely and then relaunch it months later as a proper free-to-play game. So not only does the whole, oh no, you can't compare this to a buy-to-play title argument not apply at all anymore just because the game went buy-to-play for a bit, even though it is back to being free-to-play, it actually never really applied to begin with because there are a lot of free-to-play games out there that are just as high quality, if not higher quality, than big AAA buy-to-play releases are. And much more importantly, most of these games all use pretty much the same business model now. You see battle passes in damn near everything, you see cosmetic microtransactions in damn near everything. So the main things that distinguish Enlisted's business model compared to other free-to-play games business model and, of course, buy-to-play games business model are the premium squads, which I have thoroughly talked about at this point, so I don't really feel the need to go over them again. 
the utter BS way it handles cosmetic microtransactions, where if you want to buy a cosmetic for your troops, you have to rebuy it not only for every single soldier you want to customize with it, but also for every single battle that you want to take part in with those cosmetics, so you're gonna have to rebuy those cosmetics for every soldier multiple times to actually have them show up in different sets of maps which is utterly absurd. And then the other distinguishing factor is the premium account situation where you buy to progress less slowly, because it's still a slow progression, but just slightly less slow if you have a premium account, and you get a couple of extra squad slots and that's kinda it. And like I said in the original video, that might work for War Thunder because War Thunder doesn't really have any competition in its market, the only other competition would be the likes of World of Warships and World of Tanks, and those aren't really much competition, let's be honest. So unfortunately, because there just aren't really any good alternatives, Gaijin can get away with pretty much whatever they want for the business model on War Thunder, and they tried to apply mostly the same business model to Enlisted, only to find out that that doesn't work when you go to a first-person shooter. There is a ton of competition in the first-person shooter market. I did see a few people saying things like, Well, name another game where you can run around with squads. Okay, Easy Red 2. Well, name another World War II combined arms first person shooter. Okay, Hell Let Loose. Post Scriptum, aka Squad 44. Oh, you, you want something more popular? Okay, well, Battlefield 5. Oh, well, uh, name a free-to-play World War II shooter. Okay, Wolfenstein Enemy Territory. I know it came out a long time ago at this point. But it's still up and running, people still play it, and it's still got quite the active community, you can still have a lot of fun with it, and it'll run on damn near any computer these days. And if you don't really care about World War II shooters, or don't really care about combined arms shooters, throw a dart and you're going to hit a free-to-play first-person shooter. So for people who aren't already locked into Enlisted because they've got sunk cost fallacy going for them, or who are specifically going to Enlisted because it is a combined arms World War II shooter that happens to be free to play, there are just so many alternatives to playing Enlisted that Gaijin and Darkflow cannot afford to try to push the War Thunder business model onto a first person shooter like Enlisted. Enlisted as a game is just okay at absolute best. It's not terrible, it's not a bad game necessarily, at least in terms of mechanics, but even with the reduction in grind, it's still far more of a grind than people are going to be willing to put up with for very long, and more importantly, because they keep locking important gameplay mechanics behind a grind wall or even outright behind a paywall, all that really says is that Darkflow and Gaijin do not respect players' time and money, and so people will just go to other games that do better respect their time and money. I mean, hell, even as greedy as Activision is, they don't pull this kind of crap with Warzone, and that's another free-to-play title, although I have a feeling most of you probably won't think of it as free-to-play, just because it has the Call of Duty name attached to it. And I absolutely guarantee you that if they were pulling the same kind of monetization BS that Enlisted does, you would absolutely not be extending them the same courtesy that you were extending Darkflow and Gaijin with Enlisted. No, the simple fact of the matter is that if Gaijin and Darkflow do not overhaul the business model of Enlisted in its entirety, then they will continue to lose new players, and they will continue to hemorrhage existing players. Because after all, why should anybody put up with a game that has squad AI so brain-dead stupid that it's practically useless and really just serves to pad the enemy's KD ratios, which shows absolutely no sign of improvement even years after the game's initial beta releases, even though the community has been constantly complaining about it the entire time, a forced grind just to unlock basic important gameplay features, let alone the extensive grind required to unlock the actually interesting equipment that you actually want to use, all the while having to go through a bunch of stuff you don't care about at all. 
All the while, of course, having the premium account status looming at you from the corner of the screen saying, Oh, hey, if you paid for premium, then you wouldn't be grinding as much. Or the constant pushing of fear of missing out by locking gameplay mechanics like paratroopers and the AA vehicles for the Axis and the USSR behind event grinds. So if you don't play the game during specific events, you just don't get access to those things unless, of course, you pay extra. Or, of course, the downright insane pricing on premium squads and the fact that premium squads are not only in the game, but many of them are outright upgrades compared to the stuff that you can get as a free player, which, even though it hasn't quite crossed the line yet, does creep ever closer to the whole pay-to-win problem. Or, of course, the downright insane way that they handle the cosmetic microtransactions, where you have to rebuy them not only for every single soldier you want to equip them to, but you also have to re buy them per map set, or especially put up with the balancing issues where certain factions are just straight up better at certain parts of the tech tree than others, meaning that when you're in certain BRs, they're going to have advantages over their opponents no matter what you do, and that's on top of the inherent balancing issues of up-tiering BR1 and 2 with BR3 players, and up-tiering BR3 players with BR4 and 5 where BR3 players just get absolutely shredded. Why should anyone put up with all of that for a game that is, frankly, just okay at best mechanically? The gunplay is just alright, it's nothing particularly special. The vehicles are fairly clunky to use, which isn't necessarily a problem, because a lot of that's just getting used to how they control, but they're not especially satisfying to use, especially early on in the progression. The map designs aren't really anything to write home about, and most importantly, the community of players isn't really a community at all. Absolutely nobody communicates other than occasionally pinging where enemies are and asking for enemy coordinates if they're in, say, an aircraft and they want to know where to blast the living crap out of them. There's an idiomatic phrase that comes to mind with this game. It's, the juice is not worth the squeeze. It's not necessarily that Enlisted is a bad game, because mechanically, it's not a bad game. It's just okay at absolute best. And given all of the crap they expect you to put up with, it's just not worth playing, putting up with all of this crap just for an experience that is okay at best. That was an undercurrent of what I was seeing through a lot of the comments received on the last video. A lot of people were saying things like, Oh, this sounds like a skill issue. Or, Oh, you just don't know what you're talking about. You need to play the game longer and learn how it works so you can actually know what you're talking about. And by then, you'll definitely enjoy playing the game and you'll be able to recommend it because the game is amazing. And somewhat mocking voice aside here, Look, do you really believe that? This game is not amazing, not by a long shot. It certainly had potential to be good if they were able to sort out all the problems with it, but since they haven't been able to sort out most of those problems in the past several years, and only ever seem to implement positive changes on an extremely rare basis, I frankly don't ever see this game realizing any of that potential. And the really sad part is that I was seeing quite a few comments on the previous video saying the game was better prior to the merge, which is depressing to think about because the game was far grindier than even when I was messing around with it for that video, to the point where you would have to grind through the same research trees over and over and over again on a per-battleground basis. You see, those sets of maps I talked about previously all used to be individual campaigns that were basically split into about six separate games. And progression was tracked separately for each, so if you wanted to get the same equipment across multiple campaigns, you would have to grind through the exact same progression multiple times, unlocking the same thing over and over and over again until eventually you get to the stuff you actually want to use. That just sounds utterly miserable, and yet somehow apparently the game was in a better state back then than it is now. I have absolutely no idea how that could even be remotely possible other than a sort of historical accuracy standpoint, but that kept coming up in the comments on the previous video, so I figured I definitely needed to mention it. But what I can tell you is that for all of the people in the previous video's comment section that were acting like this economy update somehow magically fixes everything I was saying about the game, that it somehow is the silver bullet, the panacea to all the ills I had with the game, 
No, it didn't fix any of that. The only thing it did is make the incredibly slow, obnoxious, tedious grind slightly less slow, tedious, and obnoxious. And sure, that is technically an improvement over how it was when I made the previous video, but it's nowhere near enough of an improvement for me to change my recommendation that you avoid Enlisted until they finally start respecting your time and money, because they clearly still do not. It seems like they're just gonna have to learn the hard way that you cannot pull the same BS that they pull with War Thunder in a game like Enlisted. There are plenty of other options if you want to play a free-to-play first-person shooter. If you want to play a combined arms World War II shooter, there are several other options for that as well, though you have to buy them in order to be able to play them. The thing is that once you've bought them, the only thing that you would buy from then on out is cosmetics if you happen to be interested in them, because everything else is just included in the game. You don't have to grind your ass off just to unlock a Gewehr 43, going through half a dozen friggin' Mauser 98 variants in order to get to it. And yeah, I know Hell Let Loose is 50 bucks right now, and it should definitely not be 50 bucks. It should be much lower than that. So I would only recommend picking that up if it's on sale. But the simple fact of the matter is you get a much better value proposition with a game like that than you do with a game like Enlisted. And at the end of the day, everyone's time and money is limited. So I don't want them wasting said time and money on games that don't respect said time and money. So if Dark Flow and Gaijin somehow ever get an absolute epiphany and completely overhaul their business model and finally do start respecting players' time and money, and hell, even just start respecting their own game, then maybe my assessment of Enlisted will change, but right now, it's pretty much the same assessment as it was before. The grind is slightly less than it was before, certainly, but even with that improvement, Enlisted is still a total mess, and I cannot recommend it in its current state. Thank you all very much for watching and putting up with the very long-winded videos that I've put together on Enlisted. I am thoroughly done with the game at this point. Frankly, even if they do give the game a substantial overhaul, I don't even really want to cover the game anymore. At this point, it feels like a boat anchor that is dragging me down, rather than something I'm actually interested in covering on the channel. I will at the very least update the video description box and probably throw a pinned comment if they do a substantial overhaul, but the simple fact of the matter is that not only do I want to move on from Enlisted, I have to move on from Enlisted if I want to get anything done on the channel. Again, it feels like a boat anchor dragging me down. So I guess we'll see what happens in the future with this game, but I'm certainly not going to hold my breath on it. Now then, I need to get back to working on clearing out the backlog, so I'm going to go ahead and do that. But before I do, I'd like to thank you all again for watching. Again, thanks for putting up with this long, kind of rambly mess of a video. And of course, if you like what I do on the channel here, please consider supporting it on Patreon. If you can't afford to or don't want to, that's fine. I understand, but the options there if you're interested, and every bit really helps out. You'd be amazed how even a dollar a month can really help out. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you all in later videos.